thank you all so much for being here today. I know that we are the last session before a networking and refreshment break. Always a fun place to be between people and coffee. Um, but really excited to talk today about the future of fandom and engagement. This panel was originally called Web3 Loyalty, Fandom and Engagement, but we realized that about two years ago, every panel had Web3 in the title. We have gone through a hype cycle now where Web3 is almost synonymous with NFT, and with the news of FTX and a number of these projects, it's almost become a bad word. So we rebranded to say, how can we talk about evolving technologies? How can we decouple the terms of NFT and all the negative things that we associate with that, and talk about the values of Web3 and what it's doing to drive fandom, engagement, when we're in a time of loyalty crisis for brands and their consumers. I have a wonderful panel today that has joined me on stage. Um, and John, if you could start, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit what you do at PepsiCo, and then we'll move on from there. Hey everyone, happy that you could all join us today. Um, like Chuck said, the hype cycle is real, but you know, at PepsiCo, we look at Web3 as the next iteration of the internet, which encompasses a lot of technologies. Um, we take a bit of a hybrid approach, so we call it the Web 2.5 mullet. So Web2 in the front, Web3 in the back. Um, you can attribute that to our leaders, Kelly and Kate, on our team. Um, I think SMT is actually using that now, too, as well. Um, and really what that means is that we are a mass consumer brand, and we have thousands of brands in our portfolio. And ultimately, it's about creating um, value exchange between brands and consumers, not necessarily talking about the underlying technology. So you know, a lot of times when we think about Web3, it gets conflated with meme coins and profile picture NFTs and crypto Twitter. And ultimately, it really is about um, at least for us, shifting the value exchange back to consumers, empowering them with um, their data and being able to share that data with the brands that they want to rather than us being able to like, just mass spam them. So things become much more personalized um, and much more um, focused on the things that they're looking to receive. Nice, appreciate it. That's, that's great. Look at that. that's, what, <laughs> that's what we're here to do. No. How's it going, everyone? Siraj Gandhi, uh, part of IPG Media Brands, uh, representing the content studio. Um, part of what we do and really work with uh, Michael and the team at uh, SMT around is figuring out how to make this really accessible to marketers, right? This new and engaging technology, uh, as well as how we can actually think about the consumer experience and really build seamless, I love the idea of like the Web Web 3 mullet, right? Web 2.0 in the front, Web, Web 3 in the back, in terms of just seamless experiences for consumer as part of a larger uh, kind of connections approach and thinking about how we use com uh, communication and messaging to ensure that we're personalized, as John said, but also really driving, again, like John said, the value exchange. I mean, it's just like I could repeat every single word, but, and, and thinking about how that lives as part of a larger media plan, right, and how, how the media, creative and media actually look to drive performance for the brand and actually business KPIs, because ultimately that's, you know, why we're doing some of this to actually get that uh, KPI going. Awesome, and Julie, I'm really excited to have you on the panel as well because ABI has been one of the earliest adopters in to the Web3 space and have taken a slightly different position. So I'd love to hear a little bit about what your role is and how you are involved with the Web3 side. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Julie from Anheuser-Busch, why did we get into the space? It <laughs> was to be an early adopter. It was to figure out what was happening in Web2 with social media. How can we anticipate that Web3 will be meaningful and learn and be positioned to execute against that. And for us, when we first started in 2021, it was really about how do I think about the power of our IP? Is it something that's relevant to consumers in a different way through Web3 and NFT applications? But really, especially once we learned more what was meaningful to us as a large company, it was about community building. And how can we use digital ownership, digital platforms to get closer to consumers and build communities in a different way. And I'll tell you that it's hard because where do you house community, right? I still don't have a good answer to that, but we're figuring it out along the way. So I've been at EB for eight years, a variety of different brand strategy uh, roles, specifically uh, leading our Web3 projects, but now my perspective is also um, tying into our broader connection strategy. Awesome, thank you. And as we're here talking about fandom and loyalty, this is something that is really interesting. Because as we look at what's happening within the social ecosystem, where this is the first time that we've seen a significant precipitous drop off in social adoption, measurement, and spend within the ecosystem, and as we're looking at a horizon of cookie deprecation, 
you know, looking at a 1% cookie deprecation in Chrome starting in January. How do we start driving measurement and a one-to-one -one relationship between a brand and their end consumer? And as we start looking at that, I'd love to hear some examples that you guys have seen of where you've had an excellent Web3 projects that have really driven that connection and that loyalty factor between um, your, your companies and your customers. Kick it up to you, John. Sounds good. Well, um, we've worked with SMT on a number of projects in the past. And like I mentioned earlier, when we think about Web3, it is the next generation of the internet, as well as emerging technologies we can take advantage of. So we've talked about the metaverse the last few years, and I think that we've seen that Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse isn't really coming to fruition, although it's starting to look pretty sharp now with this next iteration. But ultimately, it's a lot about how do we create immersive experiences that meet consumers where they are, and how do we incentivize behavior that they would like to do? So we did a really fun activation with SMT where um, it was in partnership with PlayStation Call of Duty, and ultimately this is when nobody can get a PlayStation, and we were able to create a very similar game experience right in your living room. So you'd open your phone, it looked like a Call of Duty map, you would drop a pin, and then in augmented reality, a crate would drop that you can actually interact with and click to unlock points. Preceding that, there was a really fun activation also with Doritos where bags of virtual chips were placed all around and consumers can go and claim them. They were also fun and shaped in the um, shapes of the PlayStation controller. So if a user collected all four, they were able to activate even stronger prizes in that airdrop drop. So really being able to have a layer of customization, again, meet consumers where they are and add value that is interoperable, right? From the program that we are as PepsiCo or consumer facing program, now this bleeds into 2X points in Call of Duty or a digital skin or unlocking a screen monitor or the ultimate prize of winning a PlayStation 5 when no one can get one. John, I'm going to jump on that word interoperability because it's super crucial as we start talking about loyalty. We know that right now the average household has 19 different loyalty subscriptions and only log into about eight of them on a monthly, if not bi-monthly basis. So there's clearly a challenge with people saying, oh, great, I have all these loyalty points, but how do I redeem them? How do I spend them? And then also on the brand side, how do I bear the cost of those loyalty points and knowing how they're going to be redeemed? So Siraj, I'd be really interested to hear from your side about how can we use these technologies to really unlock creativity and start building some of that authentic relationship back with the consumers. You know, it's interesting because you, you, you said 19, right? Is that the number? I, I, I believe you because you know. The one facts. I Googled this morning. <laughs> nice. But you, you think about that. How many of you guys logged into in, in your recent past, right? And the, the reality is there's this whole... Thing that's been created in the loyalty industry around driving as much use case and uh, re reuse and reuse to get more points and more points and all of a sudden it's all about just super users that end up having the greatest points right you had uh, delta airlines just yesterday right the ceo come back and say we have to reassess the whole loyalty program because everyone was so angry about it and i think that's indicative of just how loyalty uh has has gone askew in in the industry today and when you think about Web3 technologies and these uh, technologies that have real interactivity, there's opportunities to really surprise and kind of delight the consumer, right? I, I, I had this uh, example, like going, Disney does this really well in their lines, right? Because you sit there for two hours and you're walking through for an experience for a minute or two. And I was, uh, I was I'll give you a real world story with my niece a couple years ago. And we would go around in this new Star Wars um, uh, ride and you just have different places where you can just take a QR code and have a little bit of a game experience, some AR experiences, and it was all about just keeping the attention, right, and through that experience. And you think about what, let's be honest, what Disney is at the parks, right? It's a big marketing opportunity to sell a lot of great toys as well as have some great experiences for people. I think we can use that as an example of not having to drive just the most amount of points that you can possibly get. Don't get me wrong, I love my Delta uh, you know, loyalty rewards program, but still, it's it's really more about those micro exchanges that brands can really have with consumers, and I think Web3 is a vehicle to unlock that, and I think if we start thinking about it from the perspective of how those small experiences are really what the value exchange consumers are looking for, that really brings uh, a perception to the brand and a, a consideration that probably the, the next generation really hasn't seen yet. Yeah, and I think Loyalty and gamification is where everything is most ripe for, for brands, and they start to bleed. You can start with loyalty and you build in gamification, or you can start with gamification and you can then 
reward behavior and build towards loyalty. And one of the programs that we've been working on at AB with Bud Light is uh, working with the NFL and taking something that's very well understood, a pick 'em program for anyone that loves football, and how can we use Web3 to differentiate and enhance that experience and future proof it in a way? Because if you ask me honestly, it doesn't need to be Web3 right now. But if I do it right with Web3, manage the costs and all that, it allows for future interoperability, it allows for future marketplace opportunities, it allows for future tokenization and reward structures. And so that's something that we're looking at to take the biggest beer brand, the biggest passion point, and figure out a way to chart a future and test things out. And the gamification is absolutely critical because you don't want to waste people's time. How do I reward them appropriately? And it's best to have them do things they already like instead of something where your program is relying on having people jump through hoops for coins that they're not even sure what, what are going to be good for, right? So, and what I think is super promising is that the next wave and generation that loves Roblox, et cetera, like it's, it's ingrained in what they, what they value, what they look for. And so how can brands bring in more gamification? And Web3 is a tool to do it. Julie, I, I want to double click on something that you said, because being in a phase where you were such early adopters, now saying, hey, we're not quite ready there. Love for you to talk a little bit about this. And we had a great conversation before about where are people, what are they expecting, and what are the promises that are being promised and not managed by brands, by the technology, and ultimately loyalty programs? Yeah, if I can start. The biggest problem right now, because Web3 is the promise of digital ownership, the biggest problem right now is people don't care about digital ownership, right? We, Web2 works so well. Things need to change with the cookie-less future, et cetera, et cetera, for Web3 to deliver its promise. So the hardest thing is the dynamic of digital ownership and ease of use, digital ownership and complexity. Because no way in this world now, where people are so used to things being easy, one click, do they want to have to jump through seven clicks to get an asset in a wallet they don't even know on, uh, what it is for, et cetera. So like, that's where technology and infrastructure needs to continue to develop for things to fall more into place. And I think that I would not recommend that all brands need to do something in Web3 right now. All brands need to know what's happening, but it's forever when you do something on the blockchain, right? And so to, to the point you're also trying to lead us towards, managing expectations for the early adopters in your collections and in your projects is very difficult, and it's very time and resource intensive. I just want to do a quick build on that, because if you think about user and consumer experience, right, which PepsiCo is all about consumer centricity, we think about how a user is actually going to engage with this, and do they care if something is on-chain or not. So even though we have Web3 in our titles, we don't always run around hitting everything with a hammer. It's very prescriptive. So we have a set of KPIs that we've got levers that we can pull to achieve a lot of those outcomes. And at the end of the day, you know, think about other technologies. Look at the evolution of music, for example. We you know, 15 years ago, used to run around saying, like, oh, I'm listening to an MP3. Right? That's the technology. Now we just say we're listening to music or we're streaming. Still sort of technology-based, but look at that evolution from 8-track to cassette to CD. And so we have always like, kind of talked about that technology in the beginning, but then it plateaus into the use case, which is enjoying music, right? So I think as we think about these technologies, it's a when and where situation. And then we also kind of, when we think about digital ownership, we actually think of that as your digital ownership of your, not an asset that you're treated as a security and you're profiting off of, or that you own part of PepsiCo, but as you own your consumer data, right? And you get to decide who you share that with. So again, in the decline of a cookie world, or a cookies world, especially as we're starting to see cross-device tracking become less and less prominent, there is a need for consumers and brands both to have a value exchange. Consumers want to be advertised to in the right way. They like non-disruptive experiences. And so if we can add those value points and have them willing to exchange first-party data for us, that becomes much more powerful than anonymous cooking tracking because it's hyper-personalized. They're bought in, and those are where you see like the increase in CLV over time. And so that's kind of, you know, without selling just an NFT to someone, how do we recognize you and reward your behavior? That was so well said, and I think the idea of not quite understanding the technology that fuels an engagement is something that we get very wrapped up in our society. It's like, oh, well, how is this powered by Web3? 
And ultimately, a very successful Web3 engagement is one where a consumer doesn't even know that they're in that environment. That they're like, that was a very cool mobile experience. I really love that now I can follow this trail of Cheeto dust through a supermarket to exactly where the product is sitting, not understanding that that's built on the ledger and using these technologies to understand that consumer's journey, but saying, this is just a super cool experience. Or having it rain a sponsor's you know, pepperoni at a football game and the user being able to catch that, that is a catch piece of pepperoni and then go to a stand and get a free piece of pizza. All of those transactions are happening behind the scenes on a Web3 ledger but the consumer is just experiencing, I just literally took a digital object out of nowhere and redeemed it for physical value. So as we're coming up on time, would love to just go through, um, talk about other innovative technologies that y'all are excited about and that are driving, again, this, this massive change in, in loyalty and adoption that we're seeing. So Saraj, if you want to kick it off with you. Should I say AI for the first time on the panel? No. We couldn't go a whole uh, panel without mentioning it. <laughs> Sorry, can't do it. It's a uh, ad week bingo. You need to, you need to, every panel say AI. No, I think, look, the, the reality here is uh, rather than speak about it, just specific emerging technologies, I think there's an idea around how to look at them from a strategic perspective, right? And what we do from a media brand standpoint is we're always looking at the content itself, right? And what we're trying to do from a, uh, a messaging standpoint and how we actually want to take a consumer around those those journey points. But it's important to understand, and I think you said it best, you need to know what's happening in the space, in the industry, with these emerging platforms, with Gen AI, with Web3, with everything we're doing from a cookie deprecation standpoint that's happening over the next couple of years, and how that's going to impact that consumer journey, and then your ability as a marketer to identify the right consumer and then give them the right message for that uh, conversion that you're looking for. Because ultimately, that's, again, the, the goal here, right? Is to drive those those executions, but then how you can actually take this new and emerging platform stack to execute against it. So I think you know it's interesting that your team is now in the strategy team because ultimately it it, it is a connections approach. Yeah, and I was going to just say follow up, Julie. You're such an, an interesting place in strategy, but with such a depth of knowledge of the ecosystems. How do you choose the right technology to mirror the experience and match with the audience? I was. I already had a thing, and now I got to change. <laughs> now I got to change. It, honestly, right now it's like the reality is it has to be goal and like end output first for the least cost. That that's one of the problems, right, with Web three. Like it depends where you are in your learning investment, and if you want to pay to learn, but as you sort of set yourself up to scale, it's, it's an important part of everything. And so um, what am I saying? I'm saying find the right projects to start small and sort of see what works along the way. But it's not technology first. It's really what matters for the consumer first. And I think anyone in marketing would say the same. It's just consumer first, consumer first, people first. Um, so that's that's what I would say. Then what am I most excited about that's being built on in the background? I can't even know what to call it because what is happening that will matter most for us is the backbone infrastructure stuff that I don't even know about that's allowing for like proper blockchain IDs that are properly encrypted and things like that which will allow for the financial sector to embrace this more, which allow for consumers to use this more, which will make it, oh yeah, this is part of my everyday life. And then the brands come in and then everything else can follow suit. So there's a lot of infrastructure stuff that's happening. I, I don't even know what to point to, but that's the critical piece to have the evolution continue. I love that. And I think for us, you know, there's a lot of surrounding technology. I think I'll keep on the topic up here where I used the word interoperable before. So being able to leave an ecosystem, maybe like a loyalty program, and interact with a partnership, like maybe a sales stadium or a ticket vendor or um, a big box retailer and be able to redeem rewards there. And or, you know, if you're holding a token and you're a fan and you're at a Yankee game and they score, um, I was going to say a home run. Um, touchdown, but home run, <laughs> then everyone can maybe get redeemed for a free Pepsi or a box of Cracker Jacks that has that token. And it's just as simple as that, that transaction. I think being able to have systems that can communicate with each other that are built on trust, and ultimately things like digital tokens and wallets, they can help with 
because of the immutable nature of the blockchain that there's transparency, which ultimately increases trust on the consumer side. And then all of our legal and compliance teams will love this. It helps reduce program fraud and risk. You know, so there are benefits across the line of how this technology might be used. And it can be very consumer centric. And then it's meant to be something that allows, again, for that value exchange that's hyper personalized. And it meets consumers where they are and with what they're doing in their daily activities. Excellent. We have uh, just a couple minutes left and want to see if there are any questions from the audience. Everyone's minds are We can take blown. AI questions. Too. <laughs> Great. Well, I'll just wrap it up here. Um, are there any existing Web3 things that you see out there that you are really excited about and would suggest anyone here either a resource to read or a program to check out? I'll plug SMT right here. Talk to these guys. They know what they're doing. <laughs> I'll second that. I mean, I would say we respect Nike a lot as a company, and you have to look at what they're doing because it's about co-creation, and it's about connecting their existing platforms and communities, and that's so smart. And then obviously everybody's knowledgeable about Starbucks and everything. It, they're always early adopters in technology, so you have to look at what's happening. I guarantee you that will evolve a lot, that program. It, it has to, to scale. But God bless them for always being there at the forefront. Another one to check out, because um, we've talked about loyalty programs today, right? And so Lufthansa recently dropped something called U-Trip. And this is a really great practical use case. And I actually think loyalty programs for airlines is... It's such a bad experience flying in general so that any additive value you like jump at, right? So that's why the Delta points are so, like everyone loves them. But where the driving behavior or outcomes or more behavior that you'd like to see, for example, they have something called cards. So if, if you flew all of their Boeing planes and collected all four or five cards of theirs, then you can get unlock rewards to the Admiral Lounge. And that's a real tangible reward, right? You take certain actions like checking into certain flights and that's verifiable claim a token, you get free in-flight Wi-Fi. So having those plus ups to experiences that people are already doing that enhances it, and airline service is like such a low bar that anything actually is a strong increase, I think that's a program worth looking at because A, it's mass, it's not really targeting um, crypto audience like the Starbucks Odyssey program might, and it's something that people can understand. Like, oh, I did, flew to this many number of countries, I claim this token, and that gives me a new status in this program. So it's something where the consumer does, his behavior is happening, they're just being rewarded for it and recognized for it. So something definitely worth checking out. Awesome. Well, thank you. Please join me in thanking the esteemed panel, and thank you all for being here and for your attention. Thank you.